morning, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the business of property. I'm your host, Cheryl Leong from Property Development Australia. So I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So at the business of property, we interview superstar guests in the property development space that share their expertise, their deals, their stories to help empower, build and grow our community of property investors and developers. So hello, Facebook land, LinkedIn and YouTube and wherever else you are listening here today. Our guest is Steve Polisi from Polisi Property and we haven't talked much about commercial property in um, in property and the business of property. So this is, you know, he is the person. Um, I mean, he's grown a huge property portfolio on his own, a mix of uh, uh, residential but predominantly commercial property, which allowed him to leave the workforce um, at the age of 30. And he's now absolutely passionate about helping other people achieve their goals and financial freedom through commercial property. And he secured about a thousand plus properties and continues to do so at the moment, even all the way from the UK, which is pretty extraordinary. So um, without further ado, Steve, please join me on the Business of Property dance floor. Hey, Cheryl, how are you going? Yeah, I'm great, the, the, the Steve Polisi. How are you? I'm not, I forgot about that, actually. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. You're so. not just any Steve, you're the Steve. <laughs> I oh, actually I do CrossFit now at a gym, and there's four Steves in the class. It gets very confusing. Yeah, so you're just like I'm the the number <laughs> one. Steve. Well, welcome, welcome, Steve, and thank you for getting up so early because it's it's. I think you said it was about seven or eight o'clock in the morning yep. where you are. No, that's um, fine. I wake up about three four a.m. anyway for my clients in Australia. That's that's awesome, and and we were just talking about this before. I love that. You know, the fact that you've been able to not only build up your own portfolio by business, which allows you to work and play from anywhere in mm -hmm. the world is amazing, um, which is why we want to have you on the segment of the business of property, not I mean, to talk about commercial property and and how, you know, the um, uh, the fundamentals of commercial property investing that developers can apply to their projects and hence we're talking about sort of commercial development 101 but let's start off a bit around why what drew you towards commercial and and not residential like 90 percent of investors yeah that's fine so I, I was originally an engineer and much like every other investor I've just started buying residential property and that was my primary focus and then when I left engineering I actually became a residential buyers agent so of that thousand plus properties that I've secured probably 600, I should probably more, 700 uh, residential properties. So, yeah. so I'm well versed in that space. Um, I was literally just like everyone else. I put commercial in the too hard, too risky basket. Mm -hmm. And then just, just through work, I had one client who had a huge residential portfolio and said, no, nah, I want to buy a commercial, Steve. Let's have, a, let's have a look at commercial. And I said the same thing. I'm like, no, nah, it's too high risk, big vacancies, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And then yeah. actually, actually had a look at some. And this was, would have been what, five, six years ago. And I was seeing like nine to twelve percent net yields. Mm. Like you go by, so not a gross like a residential, a net yield. And I was going back looking. You could buy like a medical center on a seven-year lease on a nine percent net yield. And I actually thought I was stuffing something. I'm like, what am I missing here? This this can't be legit. Like buying a million-dollar property and getting like a sixty-thousand-dollar passive income from it from the get-go. Like I was just like. There's, I'm missing something here and then couldn't find anything wrong and then bought that one then bought another one and then started buying a couple every month and then that went to 10, 12 a month and I was just like, no, this is a this is a game. If you get it right, the returns on commercial smash residential, um, yeah. but you can also burn yourself a lot easier if you don't know what you're doing. There's a lot more duds. So you need to be yeah. mindful and more work like residential, you can go out and as long as you don't buy in a, a silly property like in a mining town or a flood zone property or something like that, you'll be okay long term. You'll have a tenant. It'll keep tickets long. If it's negatively geared, five grand a year or so, and you're not going to financially burn yourself. But if you go out and you buy a bad commercial and it does sit there vacant for two, three, five years, that's 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 going to hurt. 
So yeah. way, way more moving parts, which I'm sure we'll get into on this chat. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to I want to address those sort of um, you know those risky and 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 the thoughts around why so many people stay away from commercial. Let's start off. You know, you talked about the high risk. Is it you know is it high risk and what what sort of risk are people referring to? Yeah. So the the, the first thing in the myth is when they say it's high risk, they say commercial's high risk, but yes. What commercial are they talking about? Are they talking about an office space? Are they talking about retail, medical, industrial? There's so many types of commercial. It's not like comparing a three-bedroom house with a three-bedroom house. They're all completely different, all different risk profiles. The main risk they're talking about is they'll always have a friend or seen a property that sits there vacant for two or three years. And then they go, oh, that's that's the thing. But there's also like industrial at the moment. Vacancy rates are between 1% and 1.5% in most capital cities. So mm. that's... That's actually on par with most residential vacancy rates. The, the difference is you get it in one go. So like with residential, you might have two or three weeks vacancy every two years or three years or whatever it may be. Mm. Commercial, you'll have no vacancy for, say, seven to 15 years, and then you'll have kind of three to six months for an industrial, that is. So yeah. Um, yeah. that's that. But then different different types of industrial, or sorry, different types of commercial will have different vacancy and risk profiles, like office space at the moment, high risk, high vacancies because people are working from home. You're also prone to like an oversupply because if you, you, it's like kind of buying like a high density apartment. You don't own a land component and there's nothing stopping a developer buying a big block next to you and building another 20 story office tower and oversupplying the market there. So Mm. they can be high risk. So I always just follow the fundamentals. So stuff with a good land component. So that'll be industrial, suburban retail and things like that and then like i said it can vary so much like you can't compare uh, a medical center that's in a converted residential property with Mm. one that's in a retail suburban strip with Mm. one that's in an office tower that's a specialized medical suite they're all different pros different cons the businesses are going to be different risk profiles the fit out costs are different the lease terms are different every commercial you need to assess on a case-by-case basis but to get to your question about the risk of vacancy, you can buy very, very low risk commercials like industrial, like I mentioned, really low risk at the moment. If you go mm-hmm. by, it's very high risk. So that's that's the main fear people have with commercial. Yeah. And and the length of vacancies, because like I said, you know, the the thought process is, oh, I've got industrial, I've got sort of one one operator in there. If things go, you know, to poop. Yep. I'm going to be, it's going to be sitting there vacant for months on end. It, it is, but you need to look at the grand scheme of things as well. And this is like an argument I had with a, a Sydney client yesterday was they were like saying, oh, no, I don't want to buy a commercial because it might sit there vacant. For, but then we actually looked at it and like a million dollar commercial is about 30, 40 grand a year passive income from the get go. Mm-hmm. And then they were going to buy a property in Western Sydney for a million dollars, which is about five or 10 grand a year negative. So my argument to them was in five years' time when this lease finishes, you're actually going to be 120, 150 grand up. So you'll be 50 grand down on the residential. You'll be 150 grand up on the commercial. So even if it was vacant for two or three years, you're still in a cash flow positive position for that property. It's just with with blinkers on, it seems like a lot in the short term. But if you kind of amortize it over the long term, it's actually not that risky. Like even if... Say I, I bought a, a bit of a dud and it was vacant for two years. Over 10 years, if it was eight years tenanted, you're still in a very, very high cash flow position from that property net result. Yeah. So, so, that, so just be mindful of that. It's just, it feels like a lot because yeah. in that moment it is, but you just budget for it. You have your buffers in place when leases are finishing. Um, but like you mentioned with, oh, yeah, the one tenant might leave. I yeah. just set up on a property in Perth a couple of days ago, actually Friday last week five tenants, uh, a million and 40,000, and it's got five tenants. So that yeah. mitigates some of those risks. I was going to mention that as well. Like similar to, to residential, I mean, diversifying your risk with multiple incomes yep. as well. And then you sort of go one tenant goes and it's not the end of the world sort of thing as well. And so, a, little, a little tip and trick you can do, Cheryl, is when you buy multiple commercial properties, don't have them all ending the lease at the same time. So mm-hmm. buy one where the lease ends in 2023 then the other yeah. one, 2024, 125. So you actually only ever have to hold like a one year worth of buffer on one property because you're, they're all shifting as they go from there. So yeah. you, you can mitigate the risk in many ways. 
Um, so let's talk about sort of development and the developers that are with us today and thinking, okay, well, I've been really keen on commercial. First of all, is there a growing demand for commercial property? And I know commercial property is sort of lumped into, you know, one, but there are all these different segments of there. One, is there a de growing demand for more commercial property? And then two, what are the top three types, you know, segments of commercial property that you see um, op good opportunities for development and developing more of? Yep, that's fine. So huge, huge demand for commercial at the moment. Like I just, the buyers agents popping up left, right and centre trying to sell. It's just buyers, especially Sydney, Melbourne, people where residential prices have gone through the roof, people are looking at a better way to get a return, which isn't yeah. they're basically playing the negative gearing aspect. So People are shifting to commercial. Like five years ago, if I mentioned the word commercial, everyone run a mile. Now I get 20 inquiries a day kind of on commercial. And it's just becoming more popular. Like idiots like me have written books. Um, there's podcasts, there's webinars like this as well. It's becoming a much more known kind of asset class. So there's a lot more people kind of looking into it. And yeah. because the market's quite grown, grown quite a lot in the last kind of two years, there's actually less sellers. So because yeah. all those people that are holding like a 10% net yielding asset, why are they going to sell it? Like where are they putting their money that they're getting a better cash flow return? So yeah. there's less properties on the market, but probably five times more buyers and that's yeah. driving up price as well. So huge, huge opportunity for developers. Uh, in terms of the space I'd be looking in, industrial is just basically the safest low risk one long term because People always say, oh, no, don't buy commercial, buy, buy residential property. People need a roof over their head. And I always cheekily respond with, where do you think the roof came from? Like, you, industrial properties are essential to life. You, everything you touch in your life has been through 10 to 15 warehouses as a minimum. Mm. So, so you buying, say, like an industrial complex surrounded by residential property, that's always going to have demand. The more development infrastructure going in in terms of population growth in that suburb increases the demand of your warehouse because you're always going to need service-based businesses like spray yeah. paint, panel beaters, fabricators, things like that. Then you're going to need the distribution ones and the storage and things like that. So they're a really versatile space and they've got land component and they've got versity, so they tick those boxes there. So industrial would be the big one for me in terms of the next five, 10 years of strong front performer. Yeah. The other one, surprisingly, on the back of COVID has actually been suburban retail. So not, mm. not like we're talking like Westfields and things like that. We're talking near the little strip malls. So like the little, the little 510 strip shops in suburbia that have the, the hairdresser, the medical center, the dentist, the barbershop, yeah. the massage, and things like that. Those have actually done really well during COVID because with the working from home culture, people mm. are no longer seeking those services in CBDs. They're going to the local. So some of those areas, the demand's kind of grown hugely. So I, I believe there'd be in some of those upcoming kind of suburbs for your developers, there'll be some really good suburban retail kind of opportunities. Yeah. And and so how do we even start? Okay, we go go back. All right, I want to invest in um, in industrial. Well, I'm an investor. I'll come in. I want to invest in industrial. And Mr. or Mrs. Developer goes, all right, this is an area. How do I even pick what area is suitable for that sort of development? Yeah, so th this is going to come down to same same as residential in some aspects. You're trying to cater for the demographic that you're, you're servicing. So depending on what area you're actually looking in, you need to look at what is the purpose of industrial in that area. So if you're in like close to the CBD or that inner ring CBD, unless it's near the airport, it's very unlikely it's going to be a large scale fabrication business, for instance because they'll get a much better bang for buck moving on the outskirts of the city where for the same rent, they can rent somewhere 10 times the size. So those businesses are going to be the smaller ones, like the, the service-based ones, like the little fabricators and spray painters and, and ones just to service like restaurants and cafes and things where they need a quick turnover. Um, yeah. However, if it's, say, near an airport or a, a port, for instance, that's going to be a distribution-based kind of focus because the people that are going to rent that space are doing turnover of product where they need to ship it out. So that'll be that focus there. So it just comes down to analysing what the demand is and who's going to be renting that space and then working it from there. Okay. So similar sort of process that you go through with residential, but how do you I guess, work out as in the types of... Um, 
service-based businesses you're catering for and because there's obviously manufacturing there's distribution that sort of thing yep so one one you just look at obviously the comparables in the area um the other golden nugget is speak with property managers they they know it's like commercial property managers know exactly who's begging for spaces and where there's a waiting list yeah and then right. that, that can be where your focus is because even like when you're building say an industrial getting the mix right between industrial and say office space is quite important yes. because they've obviously got a, a mix between mezzanine areas and yeah. office spaces in each of the warehouse complex some yeah. of the more kind of white collar areas they want to move their business in there and they might say want a 50 percent warehouse floor space to a 50 percent office space yeah. whereas if you're catering for say those fabrication type ones they don't care about the office space that's only 10 to 20 percent they want yeah. the actual floor space so you cater for those needs as well but Property managers are worth their weight in gold. Speak to two or three property managers, find out the biggest demand. Some of them, there's a three to six month waiting list for properties. So if you wow. can find, find that void and fill that void, you'll get yeah. top, top rent above market rate and fill it really quickly as well. So obviously you're talking about commercial property agents who are specifically, you're not the run of the mill residential property agent or... Yeah commercial specialized commercial property management so there's there's a whole world of property management just for commercial like there is residential yeah absolutely and 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 what you're saying is that these businesses and people are going to these people first because it's it's quite you know um counterintuitive because generally like tenants don't go hunting for a property manager like residential tenants don't go for property managers to say are there any properties well they might they go on realestate.com um it's more a I've, what I'm hearing, it's more a proactive um, means of delivering stock rather than it going, I'm just going to try yeah, and Yes and no. It's probably more comparable to, say, an owner-occupier buying a residential property because they'll go to an open home and they'll put a bid in and they'll lose yes. and then the property manager will have them on their book. Sorry, the sales agent will have them on their books yes. and then they know when something else comes up, they can kind of send it to them and try to get the deal done. So that's, that's more the case because they'll inquire, like if they're actively looking on real commercial for places to lease, they're yeah. going to inquire on everything that comes on. So as soon as something comes on, they're obviously going to try to get it. And if they lose out, then they're sort, sort of next in line in a way, but not really. But so they'll know exactly. And then the property managers will talk to all the tenants because they know what's going on. And, mm -hmm. and, and local area experts always know, much like property managers, like for residential, they know exactly whether a three-bedroom rents better than a four-bedroom, whether they want pools or secure yards and things like that. They'll, they'll know those nuances that you need to know in that area. Okay. So let's talk about yields. And I've got a question that I want to, um, someone in the audience has asked as well. Um, yields and the numbers. I mean, what's still achievable in the current market where you've got a very, very um, active market? You know, are you still able to get those 10% net yields? Like you no. mentioned. They're definitely not. So yields have compressed <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. Most most capital cities I'm buying between five and five and a half percent net. Um, if you go outside of capital cities like the the Rockhamptons and the Townsvilles that carry a bit more risk in terms of vacancy rates, um, mm -hmm. you can get six and a half to kind of seven percent. You can obviously get more, but generally, if you're kind of toying with that line, you're playing with fire. Um, yes. But just generally, five to five and a half. You've got to remember as well, though, five years ago when we were getting 10% yields, interest rates were at kind of four and a half, five percent So now you can get a, an ANZ loan on 80% LVR for 30 years at 2.8%. So, so even though you get, yep, commercial loan. So even though you're getting half the yield, you're actually paying half the interest repayments as well. So the, the actual cash flow isn't that different. Um, Again, it would have been great to buy that same property five years ago and you'd have double the cash flow now. But that, yeah. that's probably, I, I tell people, you can't get angry when property grows because that's also why we buy property. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, I guess this is the other thing, capital growth. Often people just go, okay, yield, commercial property, we're looking for the yield. What, what um, uh, I was going to say, it's a, is it a myth that there's not as much growth in capital, um, in commercial property? Yeah, this is my biggest bugbear of why people, I don't know why they say it. Where, where I think it comes from is, one, things like an office tower. That is not going to grow the same as a house because it doesn't have a land component. It's similar to buying like a high density off the plan apartment. Like it's not the same. So I think office space is kind of skewed a little bit. 
The other th the factor why I think it comes from is the market doesn't move at the same time as residential because because you've got longer leases, you don't actually realise the capital growth until a few years after the market's kind of moved because when you renew the lease and they get a revalue and it kind of comes that way. So all that happens, like all the residential people will have their properties grow for a few years and be like, oh, look, the commercial hasn't grown and my residential's grown quite a lot. What they're not talking about is when the residential stops growing and commercial keeps growing that you're still getting capital growth there. On average for suburban retail and industrial, we're seeing between 5.2 and 6.4% on average in the last 30 years. So that's that's pretty similar to residential. Yeah. One of the things is it almost has to grow similar to residential because if it didn't, you'd end up with a huge price disparity. Like if, say, 10 years ago in Melbourne or Sydney, you are buying a million-dollar house and next to it was a $500,000 warehouse, the residential house doesn't go to $2 million and then the warehouse stays there at five hundred grand because anyone living in a $2 million house is going to look at that going, I'm getting more rent for that five hundred grand warehouse. Why would I buy the house next door for $2 million? And then they shift and they move their money there. That's what usually happened. Um, however, now we're in a kind of a crazy market where commercial's grown as well. We're seeing 20, 30% growth in the last couple of years as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is happening at the same time. But complete myth, you get really good, if not the same. I arguably think we're going to get better capital growth in the next three years in commercial as people look for cash flow over yeah. just you know, the, the cash, capital growth play. Uh, yeah. But yeah, complete myth. Yeah. The second myth would be, I think comes up quite often, you've got to be like they're expensive. Commercial property is expensive and expensive then we're talking about millions of dollars, yeah. whereas I've seen properties 50, 10, you know, 50,000, 100,000. You know, would you say like for, for people that are getting into the property space um, that um, on average, you know, what to sort of what are the, the price ranges? that yeah. you can see in commercial property. Yeah, exactly right. That, that, that's a bit of a myth with like you have to spend a lot of money. And it's just because the news outlets obviously report the big businesses going in like the Westfields and the Bunnings yeah. and things like those McDonald's sales and things like that. There's still lots of little warehouses, offices, retails and things like that. Um, you can buy things as simple as a car park for obviously twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. But in terms of getting into a good quality asset, I'd say you'd, you'd probably start at about one fifty k That'll yeah. get you into a small warehouse. Um, I bought a couple of months ago a warehouse on the Sunshine Coast for 180000 which was just yeah. like a 90-square-metre warehouse. Um, you can get good stock like that, which is just versatile, simple. Um, so anywhere from there. Then as you move into, obviously, the, the 500, 600K type stuff, you get kind of slightly larger, better quality tenants in terms of like they might have two or three staff, sign a three-by-three, four-by-four lease. Yeah. And then as you get into that million-dollar plus, um, that can be a game changer. That's where you start looking at like the multi-tenancies, the free standings and things like that. But again, these are these are all just kind of blanket rules. Um, I bought a freestanding hairdresser in Toowoomba um, a couple months ago for 390000 So It's a freestanding building, hairdresser, fresh five-year lease. That stuff pops up as well. But again, there's a pro and con to everything. Yeah. So question here, what, question would, what questions do you wish new clients asked you more often? Ooh, that's a Ooh, okay. I'll, I'll say I'll kind of rephrase this in a way. I'll tell you what they they focus on, what they shouldn't focus on. Yeah. Everyone in commercial seems to focus. They, they bring the residential mindset and they focus on price. They think I need to buy something at the best price possible, and they miss out on some really good quality deals. Like for me, my focus is always in the next 10, 20 years when I make a purchase. So like, if I'm buying a million dollar commercial. And this is going to sound bad because I'm a buyer's agent and I know I'm supposed to get the best price possible, yada, yada, yada. It doesn't matter if you buy it at 980K or 1,020,000 if it's a good quality asset because that's 40 grand a year positive. If you yeah. don't buy that and you sit there for six months trying to get a better deal, find that unicorn, you're actually in a worse net position. If I've, if yeah. I've got the option of getting a 980K property or a million and 20 and they've got the same yield of whatever it may be, but I think the, the million and 21 is a better quality property. I will buy that because in 10 years time, if it's worth $2 million, I don't care if I pay 980 or 1 million and 20,000. For me, it's the quality of the asset. Long term, focus on good tenant, good location, good infrastructure spending, population growth, low vacancy rates in the region, good fit out costs. Focus on all those fundamentals first. 
and yeah. then the price is second to that. Yeah. Uh, two things I really want to cover in, in this session. One is around finance mm -hmm. and understanding how you can go about buying commercial property. Do you need to worry about serviceability? Um, talk to talk a little bit about these um, lease lease stock loans yeah. as well. So let's talk about the first one: serviceability. Do we need like similar to residential serviceability to purchase commercial? Yep. So with with commercial, there's different types of loans. So you've got the standard full doc loans, and then the the lease doc loans, and then no doc loans as well. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, so the full doc loans, is is pretty similar to residential. So that's where they assess your income and your serviceability and all that type of stuff and get loan. The point to note is because we're a much higher cash flow from the property though. So when when mm. the banks apply their criteria, most, most banks are applying between 1.25 to 1.5% extra interest rates on the on the loan. They're looking at P&I, even if you're on interest only loans anyway, and they're shading the rent of the property by 20%. So they're taking 20% off the rent. So effectively 80% occupancy levels. With a commercial, that property is still well in the green, whereas mm. with a neutrally geared residential property, you do that criteria, you turn in the red pretty quick. So yeah. it still gives you a really good serviceability to keep moving forward. Um, at some point, though, you'll hit your serviceability limit just from their risk profiling of your circumstances when they do the five Cs of kind of credit rating, things like that. Yeah. So that's an option there. So if you're coming towards the end of your serviceability limit, looking at commercial is a good way to beef it up. Like if you've got a neutrally geared portfolio, and they apply that criteria and it makes you 30, 40 grand negative, by buying a 40 grand positive property, you can bring that back to neutral. So you might be able to squeeze out another one or two properties. Mm. Um, so there's mindful that. Then I'll count that this is the main benefit of commercial um, lease stock loans. So that's a loan based on the strength of your lease. So mm. they'll give you a loan. So buy your property with a four-year lease on it. The banks will give you a four-year loan for that property, typically on interest only. So they yeah. just take that property in isolation. There's a few criteria about your personal circumstances, but mainly it's the property itself. And then what happens is at the end of the four-year lease, if that when that lease finishes and they renew, you go back to the lender, you get another valuation, and then you get another four-year lease. So this yeah. is what most, most investors that have big portfolios would do. So like me personally, my last couple of commercials, lease stock loans is just saying keep moving forward that way. Um, there are a little bit of risks, obviously, with them. So the first one is obviously it's a high interest rate because it is, they're giving you money when other people won't. It's not outrageous. It's normally between 2.9 and kind of 3.6%. So it's still still reasonably strong. Um, and then what happens is at the end of the lease, if your tenant doesn't renew, you obviously then need to handle the mortgage repayment in full. Banks mm -hmm. will normally increase the interest rate slightly for you. They, they will work with you. Um, but you're going to have, obviously, a higher interest rate, sometimes up at around the 5% um, that you need to pay until you get a new tenant. Then you'll go back, refinance, get the lease stock loan and move forward that way. Yeah, awesome. I've got a few more questions here. So when investing, what was the best advice you were given and also what was the worst advice you were given? Wow, some really deep questions. Oh, that is a deep one. Um, the best advice is going to sound just just do your due diligence, but do it properly. It's it's not like residential where you can just have a look on kind of realestate.com and go, oh, that's a pretty picture. And that's why I get a lot of clients that go, oh, have you seen this one, Steve? And then I just say, have you checked this, 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 and this? It's mm. a lot of work. Before you even can make an offer on a commercial, there's probably two or three hours work just looking at comparable sales, comparable rents, looking at vacancy rates. It's, it's not as simple as residential. You can't go on like SQM and check up vacancy rates. You actually have to talk to property managers, go on CoreLogic, find similar properties, look at their sales campaigns, their leasing campaigns, do all that kind of analysis first. Then you've got to analyze the tenant fit out, et cetera, et cetera. So actually just doing the work. So that that that's probably the best, best advice I've kind of given. The worst advice... Um, was some of the people said just buy based on yield. Don't worry about long term. Just get buy based on yield. Chase yields. Get the cash flow no matter where it is. I've shifted since then. I I now still folk, capital growth is a huge focus for me because that's yeah. that's where you make a lot of your money. And to be honest, you'll get a better net return. Like if I can buy a property in Brisbane on a five and a half percent yield versus a six and a half percent one in say Townsville. Mm -hmm. I will go the five and a half percent one if I think it's got better capital growth prospects yeah. and tighter vacancy rates because tighter vacancy rates will bring me rental increases and capital growth. 
So I think my net result will actually be much better and yeah. I'll also have lower risk in terms of that vacancy period where I'm not shooting myself in the foot for a couple of years where I can't invest because I have a vacant property. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I did have a question around um, – I'm going to fill it in with this one first. A yeah. small industrial development in the right area and keeping and refinances on the basis of capital – Capitalised rate of rent. I think you can yep. see that there. A viable option compared to standard residential development is a small residential, a small industrial development in the right area and yep. keep refinance. Okay. Yeah, got it. It's basically asking, is a small industrial development as good as a residential development? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, if you get the numbers right, it's 100%. Um, one, one of the funny things I've actually found, though, with my clients that do do the developments the small developments, you actually make a better margin than the large ones, which is not normally always the case in residential. Mm -hmm. And by large, I'm talking the big boy large ones, like the $200 million ones, because the people that are doing those are normally, normally kind of dispersing their risk over lots of investments. So they might have seven to 10 of these developments all going at the same time. So they can have like basically risk mitigate, like they'll aim to make six to 10% profit but because it's over like seven to 10 properties, some might make 15%, some might make 5% and they kind of do that. They're, they're just looking at a return based only. Whereas okay. the smaller ones, you can still make that 15 to 25% profit. Again, if you know what you're doing, um, but again, you, it's about risk mitigation, like building a, 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 it depends what area you're buying in, but normally if you're trying to sell it with a tenant because you'll get a slightly better bang for buck in terms of the, the price you sell it for, assuming you're buying an area where there's a huge interest for investors to buy tenanted properties if it's yeah. an owner occupied location cool you can sell them effectively off the plan and get it done dusted early but you need to handle the the basically the debt for a longer period because it's not like residential where as soon as it's finished someone moved in what normally happens is say you've got a strip of 10 10 warehouses that takes a lot longer to fill than having one free in a, a group of 10 where nine of them are full mm. because normally businesses don't want to be the first one to jump on an empty warehouse. Like if there's a whole in warehouse complex, the first one might actually take you six to 12 months to get a tenant and you'll have to give them a rental concession. So you'll have to give them a reduced rent to get them in there for things. But then what happens is it exponentially speeds up the more you fill. So like it might take you six to 18 months to kind of fill half of them. Then you'll fill the last half in two or three months because they all kind of jump on it. So it's, it's about balancing those lease terms and incentives versus who you're planning to sell it to as well, which is where I probably come in. Yeah, yeah. So my question was around refinance, by the way. So mm -hmm. so residential property, you could refinance every three months if mm -hmm. you want to sort of thing. Is it the same with commercial? Yep. So so with, with both full dock and lease dock, you can refinance wherever you want. The difference is you actually pay for valuations. It's not as simple as just doing a quick kind of desktop valuation. The banks give you a value and spit it out. They actually send someone to the property. They they basically do what I do for due diligence. They give you like a 40-page due diligence report on the property, find yeah. out like the travel sales, leases, rents, all that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's normally between on a small standard residential uh, commercial, uh, eight hundred dollars to two and a half grand. Yeah. So you theoretically could do it, but you'd you'd want to be sure that you're going to get a good value. Otherwise, you're just kind of throwing money down the drain. What most people do, though, is just do it at the end of the lease terms. So once they get the new fresh lease, they'll go yeah. back and pay that fee, knowing that they're most likely going to get a really strong valuation. Um, however, case by case, like any of my clients that bought something four years ago on a five-year lease, the market's yeah. moved so much in the last two years, they've gone back, paid the valuation, pulled out the money so they can go again. So there's a little bit more of a balancing act in terms of that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the tenants themselves. Like how much does do you as the investor um, or even sort of the bank want the states of the, the tenant and their business? Yep, so bank, banks are just doing their risk profiling, the same as you should be doing. So there's certain asset classes and types of tenants they obviously don't like and postcodes, for instance, like not going to like mining towns. Certain, certain tenants they, they hate at the moment. So like they don't like buying banks because they, they foresee, which is funny because they are a bank, that they, they know they're reducing floor space. Like people yeah. don't walk into retail banks anymore. Like I've, I've not been in a bank for four or five years. So yeah. they're all reducing floor space. So they know that's a, a risky tenant. So they'll red flag that. 
Yeah. Um, a petrol station, for instance, they know we're shifting to like electric cars. They're a yeah. high risk one environmentally as well. So yeah. they don't touch those. So they'll analyze it the same as you. They'll look at, make sure you get a good long-term tenant. Um, yeah. They're loving industrial at the moment. They're loving suburban retail. They'll just mainly look at like who the tenant is and what the lease terms are and then see how bulletproof it is around that. Okay, cool. All right, we've got a question here. What are the red flags to look out for when engaging a buyer's agent? You've got some really good questions here, oh. Steve. This one's a hard one, and this this is it's always the case with buyer's agents because you don't know if you've got a good or bad buyer's agent until you've got a bad property under, yeah. under your cards. My, my life lesson here for whoever asked this question is never trust anyone in real estate, ever. Like, it's just a general, anyone who gets paid by someone, their incentive is to get paid, not you. There's only one person who cares about your financial well-being, and that's yourself. So make sure you're happy with every purchase. So if you're going to choose a buyer's agent, even when they send you information, go through it, make sure you're happy with it like you're buying it yourself. Get as educated as you can and go from there. Just, just talk to multiple buyers agents, ask to speak with kind of past clients and things like that. But, but it is such a weird one. Like, like in the past, like some of the properties I weren't fans of, my clients absolutely loved and I, I told them the risks and some of the properties I own in my portfolio, I've actually sent to clients first and they said no to it and I bought it myself. And it's because everyone's just got a preconceived notion of what's a good property. Some people yeah. like proximity to CBD. Some people want long lease terms. Some people want certain types of tenants. Some people want value-add, development potential. So there's there's no criteria. No one's got a crystal ball. It's the same as how do you tell a good residential buyer's agent from a, a bad one? They, you, you don't know because we're forecasting. But yeah. I, I buy boring properties. I buy this simple, good tenant, good locations, long leases, low vacancy rates. I keep it simple. The, the least exciting properties for me are generally the best performing ones. Yeah. So going going to sort of um, going on from tenants. So is it more hands off than residential? Yep, def definitely so. And the, the main reason for that is tenants look after all the outgoings. So mm. they, they 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 do they look after council rates, water rates, maintenance of the property. Um, if you're buying a property generally over the land tax threshold, they'll even pay your land tax bill. So the only outgoing you generally have to worry about is whatever debt you have on the property, so your mortgage. Yes. Um, and in some instances, they won't pay your, your property manager's fees. So you have to pay that. So it's completely handoff because they're responsible for everything. They don't need to go to you for anything. So the only times you ever really kind of have an issue is COVID, obviously. You get some people that come and they, they give you the financials and say, look, we're struggling with business. Can we have a rental concession? Or yes. when you get to the end of the lease terms. So when you get to the end of the lease terms, but again, a good property manager will handle that. They'll come to you and say, hey, look, they're trying to negotiate this. This is where I think the market's at. Are you happy with that? So it's a complete hands-off one, which I really like. So if you've got a lease term that's, say, five years, um, what's the expectation in uh, the property manager? What's their general, um, you know, follow-up or, you know, checking in on the tenant? Is it is it the same process as residential or is it quite different? No, it's the exact same process. Um, every property manager is going to have their own kind of criteria in the way they operate, but normally you'd want to do an inspection every six months. Yeah. But then their, their main aim is just to make sure that the tenant is doing what they're supposed to be doing, so upholding the lease. So that's yeah. paying their paying their rates on time, making sure they've got ag um, adequate insurances like public indemnity and things like that, um, yeah. and that all the bills and rents and stuff are paid on time. So that's they'll just be monitoring that. Then they'll go and obviously monitor the condition of the property just to make sure they're not causing huge amounts of damage and things like that. But yeah. to be honest, like if you're buying a warehouse, there's not much you can do. It's three concrete tilt-up panels and a roller door. Um, and if you're buying a suburban retail, the presentation of the actual retail is quite important to the tenant anyway. So most of the time they're actually looking after it themselves. Like um, I own a cafe um, in Ipswich personally. It's just next to Ipswich Station. It's a little freestanding building. Um, it's actually one of the ones I sent to my clients that I mentioned before, and they all said no to it. Um, 10 car spots, development potential up to 42 metres. Um, yeah. That tenant renovated the whole building for me free of charge. He actually wow. came to my property manager and said, oh, we want to like render the outside of the building, put a new roof on, make the facades yeah. really nice. Is, is it okay if we do it? My property manager came to me. I'm just like, yes, you, yes, you can increase the, the value of my property free of charge. So you get stuff like that. And it's a good indicator that I know they're going to be there long term as well. 
because if they're spending fifty, sixty thousand dollars renovating the property, they're not planning to leave in two or three years. They're going to stay five, six, seven years because they want to bring their business in because of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, question here: Do you encourage your clients to use property managers or not? Yes, hundred percent, every single time. Same as residential. You you can do it yourself because it is a bit easier. However, the legislation constantly changes. For me, it's when when shit hits the fan, if I'm honest. Like, you yeah. want a property manager there who can look after it. I also like the disparity between the owner and the property manager because the property manager can play on that. They can say, they can paint you as the evil owner yeah. if be, and they can be the nice guy, good cop, bad cop kind of one. Yeah. Um, and, been, and in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't cost that much. Like, you're paying a couple grand, three grand a year for a property manager. To mitigate all that risk, all that hassle, and then at tax time, I get an end of financial year statement saying, there it is, Steve, send it to your accountant. That is way more useful. But I can imagine if I didn't have property managers during COVID, the amount of inquiries and stuff you'd get and staying up to date with the legislation and all of that, it's just not worth it for me. If you want to be an active investor, cool, you can probably manage it because it's not that much work. But I'd be, be wary if it, if it turns bad. Um, tenants will always cry poor as well. I've never met a tenant who says to their owner, we are doing so well, we are making so much money because guess what happens at least for you? You charge them top rent. So they're always yep. going to cry poor. Being that direct point of contact, just nah, get rid of it. Get a property manager every time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, same same thing with residential. I wouldn't wouldn't have a property without a property manager there. Uh, just creates that that distance, like you said. Um, Steve, I know that was um, you mentioned as well that you don't deal with a lot of development yourself. Have you developed commercial property? And no, no? I haven't. so that's that's next next life task for me is to get involved that's in that, and that's actually why I've started. That's why I know the facts about how the big boys like have a less profit margin, things like that. So I'm slowly rolling into that. That's going to be a next task there. And it's just. Okay. Okay. I was okay. say, it's just like residential loads. You need need a lot more cash to kind of get in the game. And yes. it's obviously going to halter my personal kind of investing as well because it's going to be a, a two-year process kind of thing. But yeah. hopefully, hopefully the rewards are there as well. Absolutely. And, and and the reason I asked not to sort of put you on the spot more than anything else was it was to sort of say, well, the good thing with commercial is that um, you've got that income because – when you do development, there's no income. Yep. That you've got this level of cash flow that's that's happening in the background, so that you're not living off bread and water for for two years as well. Um, so yeah, there's that, that there's that benefit of of having a commercial portfolio along with doing developments on the side as well. Yeah, and I always recommend diversification is always great. Like I the. This, we'll, we'll have a chat about that. So, like, sometimes people ask me why, when, when do you know when commercial's right for you? Like, mm. when, when should you buy a commercial? And the answer is going to depend for everyone. Like, if I've got a a 60-year-old client and they want to retire in five years' time on a passive income, buying a mutually geared residential property does not help them with that retirement plan. Mm. So, even if they don't have a portfolio in residential, but they've got quite a lot of capital there, I'd probably recommend personally going to commercial because it'll give them the, the cash flow instantly. Yeah. If I've got, say, on the flip side, a, a young client, a, a 20-year-old, and they don't own any properties, the main benefit of property is leveraging, using yeah. the bank's money to leverage. So while you're young and I know they're going to be working the next 5, 10, 15 years, leverage. And with commercial, you can only get a maximum 80% LVR. Most of the time, it's 70% LVR. I would much rather that client go out and buy three residential properties on 10% loans and pay LMI because you'll have a portfolio that's three times as large, probably similar cash flow. If he's buying cash flow positive residential um, because he's got three times as much, if he's getting three or four or five grand a year positive out of those residential and he's buying three of them, he's probably getting close to the commercial rent anyway. And then if the market moves, he makes three times as much money. So there's that end of the spectrum. And then... All the way in between, you've got the people with two or three residential properties. Some are getting towards their serviceability limit. So that's yeah. where you need to look at, cool, I need to do something different here. Otherwise, I'm going to buy and this will be my last purchase for a while. Cool, mm -hmm. commercial is an option. Um, and then the other one is sometimes people just want to have a little passive income. So they might have the serviceability for residential, but 
their partner might be going on paternity leave, for instance, for a couple of years, and they go, oh, it'd be nice to have a little 30 grand passive income for that couple of years. Cool, yeah. commercial might be a right option then. So it's just weighing up your what, what you're actually trying to achieve over what time frame versus what your risk profile is, and then decide from there. Amazing. Awesome, Steve. I think that's been a fantastic segment. I want to have a quick segue to, obviously, there's a book fair. Tell us a bit about the book and how we can get our hands on it because I'm sure everyone that's been listening here is going to be like, I want to learn more about commercial property now. Yeah, that's fine. So I, I actually didn't plan to write a book. I was actually on all my sales calls. I actually got sick of explaining commercial to every single client. Like all my calls were going for two hours because I was basically explaining what we've had a chat about today, plus all how leases work and outgoings. And all that. So I'm like, yes. cool, I'm going to write a little ebook where I'll send them that before the call so they can read that so we can have a, a really good kind of conversation about strategy instead. And then 20 pages went to 50, 80 went to 120. I went, all right, there's a book here and then wrote 300 pages. So got a book, a publisher, we decided to publish it in stores and airports and stuff like that. So awesome. yeah, it's 300 pages on everything you need to know about commercial. It's not dream selling. It's like a textbook. So if you want to go to bed, just, just read it. It'll knock you out quite easily. Um, but 300 pages. Um, you sort of suck it <laughs> so just um, go to my website. Um, if you want it for free, I'll send you a hard copy of it for free. Just type in the word free book on my website and I'll send you a copy. So policyproperty.com and head to this part that says free book or is it resources? Uh, free book. It's also in resources. There's also plenty of free spreadsheets and resources on there you can download. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Well, anyone that's interested to either purchase their own commercial property, obviously do a whole lot of education and learning. If you sort of don't really feel that that's your thing, that's where Steve comes in. Tell us really, really quickly about what it is that you do. All right, so I, I effectively just do the whole process for you. So I go out, I find the property for you. I do the negotiations. I do the due diligence. I hold your hand through the settlement process. So if you need a conveyancer, building and pest inspector, property manager, valuer, I'll recommend all those along the way. But the crutch of the business is just getting you a really good low risk commercial that's got a high cash flow and capital growth prospects. Amazing. Sold. Take my money. <laughs> Oh, good, Steve. Thank you so much for all that, that sharing and knowledge. Um, anyone that wants to get in touch with Steve, he is pretty active on the socials, so Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, so drop him drop him a DM. He is the Steve, uh, so you can't forget <laughs> that. And and he doesn't sleep because he, you know, he's on the other side of the world. So when you're when you're asleep, he's awake um, and hunting down properties as well. So. Thank you. Take no, care. That was fun. Thanks, Cheryl. No, not, a, not a problem. You take care. Keep well. Enjoy enjoy the skiing. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this session of the Business of Property. If you enjoyed that session and you want to listen to replays of previous um, Business of Property episodes, please head over to Cheryl Leong on YouTube. Do the whole like and subscribe and notified when we have a new session. So till next week, take care, keep well and stay safe. Bye-bye.